know, Jesus Christ was presented long before he was born, over 500 years before he was born. It's very, very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hibbert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, a program that is designed to take you through the Bible in one year, from Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Today, we land in the Minor Prophets. The prophet is called Micah. Very, very interesting. Corey is here. Corey, what's up? We're looking at King Ahaz, a king that Micah mentions by name. All right, very good. Look forward to that, Corey. And what did you do, Janice? Today we're going to read some letters and have a special time of prayer. Excellent. Very good. Look forward to that. And Ryan is here. Tell us what you're doing, Ryan. Jonah, is it just a whale of a tale? Or could this amazing story be absolutely true? All right, all of this and more coming your way in the next half hour. So get your Bible guide and your Bible because it's time to study Micah. Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Now gather yourselves in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. When the Assyrian comes into our land and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, who, if he passes through, both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver. Your hands shall be lifted against your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Jesus Christ is the most unique name and title, title as well, throughout all of time, past, present, and future. The works and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ were accomplished in the center of time, I believe, so that we could better understand the plan and the purpose of his life when he was our shepherd here on earth. Now, the Bible reports that Jesus Christ will return again soon and that he will make right everything that is wrong. Now that is known as the messianic rule or the reign of Messiah, which is Christ in Greek. During the eighth century BC, God prophets prophesied to tell about the coming of Messiah and what he would accomplish. Micah was one of those prophets filled with God's Holy Spirit who proclaimed God's word for the future hundreds of years before it happened and how God would ultimately deal, watch this, with the sin in our lives. Sin is the problem. In fact, it is the big problem. And so we have to remember that as we deal with this and as we see this, every prophet in the Bible, and in fact, every person in the Bible that God has placed there is dealing with sin or talking about sin. And as we look at the prophet Micah, we discover that. Now, the purpose of Christ, 
The purpose of Messiah is right here in the scripture. And as we look at it, let's listen to what God says as we study Micah chapter 5. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would show us what you're doing and show us how we should do it. Because God, we have sin and sin has to be taken down by the power of your name. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to do that if we have it. And in Jesus' name, continue to sanctify us and make us right before you. And we said together, amen. Get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we begin to study with your Bible. The most important book you'll ever read is the Bible. And let's look at Micah. This is important. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can write to us and and we'll send it to you. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. Just do me a favor and pray about a donation because a donation will be great. Thank you so much for doing that, especially right now. But let's look at Micah because this is important. Micah chapter 5, it says, Now gather yourselves in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Now look at this. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem, Euphrathia, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me one to be ruler in Israel. Isn't that interesting? One, capital O, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old and from everlasting. Are you serious? Yes, I am. This is a mention of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was present before time began. Before time began. We can see God's plan in the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testaments. And God shows us through Micah that he was in existence. Jesus Christ was in existence. And John chapter 1 says, from the beginning, he was always there with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Very important to remember that. God wasn't created. Jesus Christ did not create himself. But he put himself in human flesh, beloved. And when he did that, he felt the, the, the cost of sin. And he experienced all that, but he lived perfectly. And that's exactly what happened. Now look at chapter 5, verse 3. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide For now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one, capital O, shall be in peace. And when the Assyrians come into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at his entrances. Thus, He shall deliver us from the Assyrians when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. Isn't that interesting? Micah is talking very clearly here. God changed everything when Jesus Christ was born. He changed the stakes. The Lord gives us strength to continue in his Holy Spirit against evil until he makes himself known in the physical. God will continue to do that in the physical. And I look forward to that time. But beloved, we must understand that we, you know, we don't, we don't follow evil. We can choose to follow God. You know, we don't let evil run over us. Like Paul says to Timothy, we flee evil. We run away from evil. We take control. And that's what we mean when we are against sin. We're not against people but we're against the forces that take us down. And those forces are sin and they're inside of each of us. That's what we need to remember. Now look at Micah chapter five, verse seven. It says, then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people. 
the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles. Look at that. And in the midst of many people, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he passes through, both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver. Your hand shall be lifted against your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. Micah is telling us something very important, beloved. We need to remember this. The Jews will be scattered and come home to Israel after being scattered. This has been happening in the last 71 years, actually more than that. Jesus is coming soon. We're at a time in our life when we see Israel emerging. I mean to tell you, I have watched it uh, since my early days. I was born in 61 and I've watched it since then. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, in 1967, they almost went out the window, but there was a miraculous thing that took place and God did some amazing things. And Israel's been getting stronger and stronger and stronger as we go. Now it's a superpower in the Middle East. I mean to tell you something has happened, beloved. We're watching God as he builds his nation, Israel. So we come to this reality. We have to pray. We have to say, Lord, you're building Israel. We're seeing this. It's happening in the end of time. Israel's never been evident before. Since 1948, it started, and now it's stronger than it's ever been. So, Lord, help me to be ready for your return, ready for your return. Please save as many people before you return. See, we need to focus our attention on others coming to Christ before Jesus Christ actually returns, because when he does return, things are going to be different, beloved. The time is coming and the time we are close into it now. Israel is 71 years old. Well, it's time to carry on with our Bible study, and I know we're in the book of Micah today, but as I mentioned on Friday's program, I want to continue our study of Jonah, and we're actually going to spend today and tomorrow on Jonah as well. Now, the reason I want to spend some time in this book is because a lot of people, including some Christians even, have a really hard time with it. I mean, come on, a giant fish swallowing a man whole and then spitting him out alive three days later? It sounds fantastical. First of all, there's a the large sea creature. Could there really have been an underwater giant large enough to swallow a man whole? And if there were, could a human being really survive the encounter? Critics of the Bible scoff at the apparent absurdity of the story of the prophet Jonah. According to Jonah chapter 1 verse 17, this prophet, while at sea and in rebellion to God, is swallowed whole by a great fish, and then after three days and nights, is vomited out onto dry land. Two objections to the historical reality of this account are often brought up. First, it is assumed that there is no known sea creature that could swallow a man whole. And second, that no one could possibly survive in the belly of a fish. Before responding to these objections, it is important to understand that there are several good reasons to believe that the book of Jonah is an accurate historical account. First, the writing style of this book is that of a normal historical narrative. Second, Jonah is identified as a historical figure in other portions of scripture, including the Gospels where Jesus Christ himself affirms him as a historical figure. And third, most Christian and Jewish scholars of the not too distant past accepted Jonah's mission trip to Nineveh as a reality. If this is not enough, archaeologists have also uncovered the ancient ruins of the city of Nineveh and have proven that it was an enormous city during biblical times. Furthermore, the two assumptions made that a person could not be swallowed whole by a great fish or survive the encounter 
have been refuted by authenticated historical reports of individuals who had their own Jonah experience. Indeed, in 1758, a great white shark swallowed a sailor after he fell overboard. After being fired at with a deck cannon, this huge shark vomited out the man, who not only survived, but was also unharmed. On a second occasion, on October 14, 1771, the Boston Post Boy newspaper reported the incredible story of Marshall Jenkins, who was swallowed by a huge sperm whale. After re-emerging out of the water, the whale vomited him out, much bruised but not seriously injured. It is clear to see that while the account of Jonah is incredible, it is nonetheless strongly supported by the evidence. This also demonstrates the historical accuracy and reliability of the Bible. You know, it shouldn't surprise us at all that the evidence supports the account of the prophet Jonah. The Bible, after all, is God's word, and so it speaks the truth. Jesus himself even confirmed this account as actual history in Matthew 12, and that should automatically settle things, at least for those who call Jesus Lord and Savior. But even if you're a skeptic, you've seen the historical evidence here documenting similar encounters. And I would encourage you to dig through these historical reports on your own. Also, if you remember, back to the June 19, 20, and 21 programs, I did a three-part scientific study on some of the most massive sea creatures that ever lived. Many of them could easily have swallowed a human whole, and significantly, the most massive creature in the world known to man still lives in the waters today. Known commonly as the blue whale, it can reach lengths of up to 100 feet and weigh up to 200 tons. Its tongue alone weighs more than an elephant, and its heart is about the size of a compact car, weighing more than half a ton. It contains 10 tons of blood and is so massive that a small child could actually crawl through one of its major blood vessels. All things considered, I don't think it's a stretch to believe that God used one of these sea monsters to deliver a message to Jonah. And that message to Jonah was to get to Nineveh. And to Nineveh he went. We'll talk more about this tomorrow with his encounter with the people of that huge city. Right now, it's time for Corey. Corey? Thanks, Ryan. So today I am going to be focusing in on the time period of the prophet Micah. Now, if we jump back to Micah chapter one, he actually gives us a timeline for his prophetic career. So the days during which he was active as a prophet of God in the land. And he says, and dates it to the days of the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Now these three kings, this grandfather, uh, son, and grandson, were kings of Judah and their capital city of Jerusalem. Today, you and I are going to be focusing in on, uh, you know, uh, one of the most evil of those three men. We're gonna be focusing in on King Ahaz. A lot was going on in his time period. During his reign is when we get, you know, a really interesting um, uh, mention in the Bible of a specific Assyrian king. We get some pagan practices beginning to be mixed in uh, again with the temple in Jerusalem. And this is a time of great apostasy. So uh, with that backdrop in mind, as we look at the reign of King Ahaz, reading then Micah's prophecies in that context becomes a very interesting endeavor because we're able to see and compare these are Micah's words and this is what he was living through at that time. So take a look and we'll talk about it afterwards. Ahaz, king of Judah, is not given a very good moral rating in the Bible. He is said to have broken away from his father and grandfathers in their efforts to follow God, and in his desperation followed after false gods. Ahaz became king after the death of his father when he was 20 years old and reigned until his death 16 years later. Ahaz had inherited a kingdom in trouble. The northern nations of Israel and Syria had joined in alliance against Judah. It appears they were trying to build a coalition strong enough to resist the growing Assyrian Empire. Judah would provide more military strength and more land for their use. King Ahaz responded by dedicating himself to pagan gods of warfare. He sacrificed some of his children and became a regular of the unsanctioned high places in Judah. He is even said to have created an industry out of pagan worship, manufacturing molded images of Baal. This was to no avail, however. The Israel-Syria alliance besieged Jerusalem, and though they did not defeat the city, there were mass amounts of casualties, including one of Ahaz's sons, possibly the crowned prince, and two of the highest officials of Jerusalem. This attack severely weakened Jerusalem and Judah, and her enemies responded. Edom attacked from the south, and the Philistines from the east. 
Isaiah 7 records how God reached out to Ahaz at this time, but without success. Ahaz instead sent messengers and treasure from the Jerusalem temple to the king of Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser III. Tiglath-Pileser responded by destroying Syria's capital city of Damascus and killing her king. Ahaz then, in his established fashion, visited the king with more tribute and had the Jerusalem temple remodeled to resemble pagan shrines. At the end of his reign, Ahaz still had his kingship, but Judah was severely weakened and was paying a staggering amount of tribute to Assyria. This tribute and Ahaz's name has been found recorded in Assyria's surviving records. Two signet seal impressions have also been identified that mention Ahaz, one belonging to a royal official and one from his very own seal. So I hope you can see that Micah's words as, uh, you know, having a backdrop of King Ahaz's reign really does make a lot of sense when you are seeing all the doom and gloom that Micah's talking about and all the apostasy of the people of, of Judah and Jerusalem. We actually see that play out in the history of the kings in Chronicles uh, with King Ahaz. Now, I think it's interesting as well that like all of the other prophets, Micah also has this, this thread of hope that comes through his prophecies and right Right after Ahaz, who do we have? We have his son Hezekiah, who, despite all of the evil of his father, mm. tries to turn it around, tries to turn mm -hmm. the kingdom around, and and because of that, manages to prolong the life of Jerusalem. Um, you know, it, it's it's a more meager life for sure, uh, but he manages to prolong it for a little bit longer and, and change the lives of the people who would live in that time period after him. So he does have a significant influence in the history of Judah and Jerusalem. So I think that's interesting that the history of this is interesting as a backdrop for Micah's prophecy for that very reason, because they seem to tie together so, so well. Yeah, they do. And in fact, uh, it's interesting to note that you've got Ahaz and you've got Hezekiah. Hezekiah really tries to, to pull up and make, you know, Jerusalem the city again, like mm -hmm. David had it, you know, this is Jerusalem, he really tries to. Yet in Hezekiah's life, it's interesting because Hezekiah, in his life, the Assyrians come in and take out northern yeah. Israel and they surround him and it's going to be over for him unless he confronts God and he says to God, perhaps you have heard what they've said about you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And God acts. One of the things that I think is so interesting about King Hezekiah um, it ties in with Micah chapter 7, where you're seeing in Micah chapter 7 uh, this ultimate reconciliation of, mm -hmm. of Judah and Israel. And it appears there is some historical precedent to believe that Hezekiah, at the beginning of his reign, was trying to accomplish this, that he was trying to reunite Israel and Judah because Israel had fallen to the Assyrian Empire. So he was, he was trying to reunite it. So it's just really interesting yeah. when you look at the prophets who were prophesying at the time of these kings to see, you know, they're, they're talking to that heart of the kings as well as to yeah. us. And I have to wonder too about how much influence Isaiah had mm -hmm. over Hezekiah as well, mm -hmm. you know, because he was a part of the royal sure line, was. it seems. He was a part of the royal family. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. And yes. I think that when people recognize that uh, this is the time, this is a very significant time, and it's the time when Israel falls uh, to Assyria, and it's the time when Jerusalem has the opportunity to to trust in God and to uh, and trust in Hezekiah and to allow, even in the presence of Reb Shekah and all of the rest of it later on, uh, says we're not gonna get upset. And even though he says it in Hebrew, we're not gonna get upset, we're not gonna get upset. And at the same time, they, they make a decision. And that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then it launches Hezekiah into a, a time of all kinds of interesting things which we've already read about. Fascinating stuff. And isn't it so, it's tempting for us to forget that we're talking about real people. Yes. Mm -hmm. With real emotions during battles. Like these were life and death situations. So a lot of times we, we read them and we think, well, why would you make a decision like mm -hmm. that? If you could stop and put yourself in those situations, which is pretty difficult in the culture in which we live today, in the world in which we live today. But I think it's easy for us sometimes to forget that these were real people that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think Definitely. that's important <laughs> because you say if, if, 
we have things available to us today that even the kings did not have available to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And uh, you know, we we are live we live in a very different time. Mm -hmm. We really do, mm -hmm. and we need to understand God is the same. That's so right. the time is different. That's right. Very and these are real people. You're real people who write into us, and I'm just going to share um, some snippets from some letters that I have. You know, Joanne says, shortly after receiving Jesus' forgiveness, someone said to me, you look different. It's so nice having God back in my life. Thank you for your love and prayers. And isn't that true? When yes. we talk about that change, it's a life change. Being born again, having Jesus Christ living inside of you changes you from the inside out. And eventually you, you can see that physical change in someone. So I just, I love that. Here's another clip. Mm. Jack says, I'm writing just a note to let you know how much I enjoy the quick study program every day on Faith TV. My love for the Bible has deepened because of all your efforts in promoting and teaching God's word. Thank you, Jack. It mm. comes from our heart. Mm. That That's really, that's really where it comes from. And so we're, we're really glad to hear that our love for the Bible can come through the TV or the internet or wherever you're watching uh, because it's, it's real in our hearts as well. So thank you, Jack, for your note. And um, Lydia says, my husband and I are very thankful to the Lord for your program, Quick Study, and we watch it every chance we get. We are seniors and the word of God is very dear to us and very interesting. We read the prayer requests as well. And I would like to request prayer for our needs and they've given us their prayer needs here. And that's what we say to you as well. We believe in the power of prayer. Uh, we pray for you, our viewers, every single day. And we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for your prayers for us. God hears our prayers together for each other and he answers them. He is a faithful God.